प्रहिणोति तस्म तम हेवत्मबुद्धि प्रकाश मुक्षुर्वै शरणम प्रपद्ये ओ शाति शाति श्रुतिस्मृतिपुराण आलय करुणाल नमा भगवत पादम शंकर लोकशंक शंकर शंकराचार्य केशव बादरायण सूत्रभाष्यकृत वंदे भगवतन पुनः ईश्वरो गुरुरात्मे मूर्ति भेद विभागिने व्योम व्याप्तहाय दक्षिणामूर्त नम मिस्टर मणि हेज समराइज द मैसेज ऑफ द उपनिषद द मैसेज ऑफ द वेदास विच कैन बी एक्सप्रेस इन अ वेरी शॉर्ट सेंटेंस वेरी फेमस सेंटेंस तत्व मसी जैट दव आर्ट जैट thou art very simple statement very short statement but a very profound statement revealing a fact about myself revealing the fact about ourselves in fact revealing a fact about the whole life that is you know this pronoun that refers to something which is remote so we always use the pronoun that for something that is remote i don't say that flower i say this flower so what is in front of me or what is an object of our knowledge for that we use the pronoun this but what is at the moment not within the scope of my knowledge which is beyond the sense perception for the remote thing i use the pronoun that so in our life there is something that is called that something which is remote something that is separated from me something which i am constantly struggling to attain thus each one of us is born a seeker in sanskrit we can say each one of us is born a mumukshu moktum ichchu mumukshu each one of us is a seeker of freedom each one wants freedom and that quest for the freedom the desire for the freedom because manifest even from the childhood there when a child also wants freedom when the parent and the mother the father says come on hold my hand and then walk with me the child will assert the freedom no i'll walk by myself they want to do things by themselves if they can and thus we find that from the childhood onwards as we grow if you analyze the various activities that we perform from morning to evening from birth to death the various activities that we perform if you analyze those activities we will find that behind every action there is a desire and desire is to become free free from some kind of limitation that i feel i constantly seem to feel a sense of limitation as a human being i am a self conscious being i am conscious of myself and the self of which i am conscious of is a limited self i find myself a limited being i find myself an inadequate being i am not quite up to my own mark i am not able to measure up to my own expectations and therefore there is also a constant current of what we may call a self non acceptance that i am not happy with myself i do not have a great respect for myself even though the whole world may respect me by by giving me all kinds of honor but within myself somehow i don't seem to have a great respect for myself because i find that i am not quite what i like to be what i like to be is one thing and what i find myself to be is something else <clears throat> and therefore i find myself a being who is not satisfactory who is not adequate who is not acceptable to myself thus within the human being there is a constant current of what we may call self non acceptance not accepting myself not being happy with myself not being satisfied with myself 
you can imagine this is a very big thing when I am not satisfied with myself. That means that there is a conflict with myself, the conflict of myself with myself. All the, if you really analyze, all the external conflicts, the conflicts that take place outside, if you really analyze that source, you'll find that all of those conflicts result from, ultimately, a conflict that is going on within the heart of a human being. And that he or she is not quite happy or satisfied with their own self. This is a conflict which is indicated as the battle of Mahabharata. As you know very well, the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita took place in the midst of a battlefield. On one side are what we call the Pandavas, on the other side are called the Kauravas. And there is a conflict between them. And in the midst of this conflict, this teaching has been imparted, which is very significant. Because conflict is something that is going on in the human heart all the time. Yes, there are moments, there are, there are moments of respite, when I do feel good about myself, when I find I'm a successful person, when I achieve something that I desire, when I come across something that is very desirable or, or something that I like or something that I love. So when I come across something that I love, all of a sudden I meet a friend after a number of years, or I'm able to solve a problem on which I've been working for some time, or I got the promotion which I very badly wanted, or thus I got something which I wanted, and my want or my desire is satisfied, there is a moment at that time when there is a momentary sense of self-acceptance. A momentary sense of freedom from what we call the self-non-acceptance or self-rejection. Isn't that, isn't that really an unfortunate thing? That I reject myself. In fact, in this scheme of creation, human being is the most exalted creation of the Creator. There is none more sophisticated than the human being in the whole universe and the whole creation and therefore human being is a very privileged being, very gifted being. But at the same time, along with the privilege goes a certain responsibility. The creator has given us a certain responsibility. If you compare ourselves a human being with other living beings, other creatures, such as animals, such as insects, such as plants, such as vegetables, other life forms, when you compare ourselves with them, one basic difference we can find between ourselves or human beings and those other living beings is that they seem to be free from their inner conflict. They seem to be free from their inner complexes of self non-acceptance or self-rejection. And therefore, they are able to live their life and it is free from conflict. Not that we want to live a life like that, but the point is that it seems as though the animals such as cows or buffaloes or what have, horses, whatever they are, at least they don't have complex within themselves that they are unhappy with themselves. A donkey accepts itself to be a donkey. Does not compete with a horse. They look, a horse is getting more respect and a horse runs faster than I am. And then why don't I compete with the horse? A donkey doesn't compete. So we don't find that kind of a competition because there is no comparison. A human being constantly compares himself or herself with others and finds that I am not quite what someone else is and therefore I strive myself to be different from what I am. This is very struggle to be different from what I am, to be better than what I am, shows that I am not satisfied with what I am right now. <clears throat> it is this conflict which is what the human being is suffering from. It is this responsibility or the challenge that the Creator has given to the human being. Whereas other beings, other living beings, other life forms are free from this inner conflict, that there is no challenge in their life. They simply live their life as programmed. There are these basic instincts of food, basic instincts of self-preservation, the basic instinct of, uh, of sense gratification. These basic instincts are there in all life forms and they simply pass their life fulfilling their instincts. They never look forward to anything beyond, above and beyond that. There is no inspiration or there is no aspiration, let us say, on the part of an animal to be bigger and better than what it is. It seems to be happy with what it is. And so, they are spared from this inner conflict. Whereas human beings seem to be burdened with this tremendous conflict. 
for the simple reason that he has been given a great responsibility. The creator, God, has given us this very beautiful body and the mind and the intellect. And apparently he has done his job. Then Lord seems to say that now it is your responsibility to carry out further evolution. So as far as the physiological evolution is concerned, the nature takes care of it. But then as far as the other evolution is concerned, the emotional evolution is concerned, the spiritual evolution is concerned. That seems to be now the responsibility of the human being. We must know also that the conflict that we have is a conflict, a spiritual conflict. Although we seem to divide people as materialists and spiritualists, we seem to divide people. We seem to feel that some people are materialists and some other people are spiritualists. But really speaking, there is no such thing as a materialist person at all because every human being or every living being is basically spirit and not matter as we will see. That what I am, I am a spirit clothed in matter. It is not that, as a scientist would tell us, that I am matter manifesting as spirit. So scientists might tell us that the spirit of the consciousness is a property of matter. And therefore, who am I? I am a pack of matter displaying or manifesting consciousness. We say, no, that is not so. I am consciousness clothed in matter, where matter becomes a vehicle of manifestation or expression of that consciousness. Thus, each one of us is a conscious being, is what we call the spirit. And therefore, each one is a spiritual being. And therefore, our problem is a spiritual problem. Therefore, the solution of the human problem of conflict, of inner conflict, has to be a spiritual solution and not a material solution. Human being doesn't understand this. And therefore, the, he feels that all right, by procuring and surrounding myself with matter, by acquiring matter, by enjoying matter, that I will be somehow able to become free from that inner conflict. <coughs> you say that freedom from the conflict is what we are seeking. <coughs> but everybody has their own idea of what causes a conflict. Everybody has their own idea of what is the cause of the conflict. And as I understand the cause, I will try to remove that cause. I feel that I am in conflict, I am inadequate, I am insufficient, I am not acceptable to myself because I am not wealthy and therefore I go ahead and acquire wealth. Someone feels that that person is not adequate because of lack of power and therefore that person proceeds to acquire power. Someone feels that that person is not adequate because of lack of respect and therefore he goes ahead to acquire name or fame or respect. And thus we find human beings doing this. Are they materialists? They are not materialists. They are all spiritual beings, they are all spiritual seekers. But they seem to have an understanding about what is bothering them. Everybody is bothered, everybody is restless within themselves. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says that human beings cannot remain quiet even for a moment because there is inner restlessness. And that restlessness compels him or her to do something. Not understanding what makes me restless, I try various solutions in my life to become free from the restlessness. And when a person tries a solution in form of acquiring matter to become free from the restlessness, we say that he is a material being. And someone else looks at the spirit in order to become free from the restlessness, we call him a spiritual being. But really speaking, everybody is a spiritual being because human problem is a spiritual problem and not a material problem. Yes, we do have material problems. There is hunger, it's a material problem. There is a thirst, material problem. Discomfort, heat, cold, poverty, illiteracy, these are all material problems we accept. We don't say that there are no material problems. There are material problems and those material problems require material solutions also. You cannot have spiritual solution for material problems. So meditation cannot help me become free from hunger. I am hungry and therefore I meditate, that doesn't quite work. There is illiteracy and I meditate, that doesn't work. So understand that we cannot apply a spiritual solution to every problem also. Thus we must sort out why, where the problem belongs to. 
No doubt there are material problems. And all the scriptures also provide, you know, the, the means or advice or, or suggestions as to how to deal with them also. But, but with all the material solutions and all the material acquisitions that we have, somehow that sense of inner discomfort doesn't seem to go. Formerly, I was a poor person, an uncomfortable person, inner discomfort. Now I'm a wealthy person, but still inner discomfort remains. That shows that the wealth, the material, the wealth, name, fame, power, they're all wonderful things to have. Don't think that these are not important things or that, that the scriptures are decrying these things. No. Because they are needed in life. And we must know where they are needed, therefore they have their right place. But we should know also as to what they can do to us. Yes, they can provide us material comfort. There is a nice story you may have heard from the Upanishads. There was a great sage whose name was Yagnyavalkya. He was a great sage, learned man, what Maniji said, Shrotriyam Brahmanishtam, very great learned, wise man. And a lot of his wisdom is, 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 is uh, found in the Vedas and the Upanishads. Once, upon, once he called his wife. Her name was Maitre. Sai Jagnyavalke calls Maitre and tells, Hey Maitre, I have decided now to renounce. I have decided now to leave home and go to the forest and live the life of a renunciate. Don't worry, I am going to leave all the wealth for you. So Maitri asks of Yajnavagya, what can a person do with the wealth? Can I gain, oh sir, if wealth was what was required in life, how come you are giving up that wealth and going away? and giving me the wealth as though the wealth is a solution in the life and by wealth we mean not only money but we mean name, fame, power, all of that goes in the name of wealth that you are giving me all of that and consoling me that I'll be happy after you leave how come you are giving them up? if all of these, if this wealth really gave the fulfillment in life how come you are giving it up and giving and, and leaving me this wealth? so can I gain that immortality by the wealth? See, Jagnyavagya says, no, my dear, you cannot gain immortality by wealth. You cannot gain that ultimate freedom by wealth. Hey, then what do I get by wealth? He says, wealth, well, with the wealth, you can live a comfortable life. But there is no hope of immortality with wealth. This is a, this is how the teaching in the Upanishad begins. <coughs> so, Human being also has the urge of immortality. Thus, let us say that there are two kinds of urges in our heart. One is the urge to fulfill the need of hunger and thirst and heat and cold and discomfort and all of these and, and poverty and illiteracy and, and all of these urges are also there and they need one kind of solution which is what science and technology provides us. At the same time, every human being has an urge to become immortal, meaning to become free from mortality. I am aware of the fact that I am a mortal being, I am subject to death and I cannot accept that. I cannot accept death of myself. I find myself an ignorant person. I have a certain amount of knowledge, but I find a tremendous limitation with reference to knowledge and therefore I suffer from a sense of ignorance. I cannot accept myself being an ignorant being. I find also that I become sad, I become depressed, I become sad, I, you know, I become unhappy. I cannot accept the unhappiness about myself, I cannot accept ignorance about myself, I cannot accept death about myself. And thus I struggle constantly to become free from death. To postpone death, I know that I cannot become free from death because I see everywhere that whatever is born is going to die and I know that I am not going to live forever but at least I would like to postpone death as much as I can, postpone it for one more day. And 
I am seeking freedom also from, as I said, unhappiness, from inner pain, from inner conflict, from inner sadness. And I am seeking freedom from ignorance. So this seeking freedom, this is also in a fundamental urge that every human being has. There is no exception at all. That is the reason why our scriptures which provide solution to this fundamental problem, they are immortal scriptures. Every scripture addresses this. Every scripture will provide solution to both the material problem as well as this. So whether it is Quran, whether it is Bible, whether it is Bhagavad Gita, they will provide a solution for the material needs also. But the fundamental occupation is to provide that spiritual solution to uh, to the human problem. That is why they are all immortal texts. They are immortal texts in the sense that they are uh, applicable to every human being at all times and all places. Otherwise the teaching imparted for hundreds of years or thousands of years may not be relevant today because we are quite different from what uh, the human beings were several hundred years ago or several thousand years ago. But we find that the solutions provided then are applicable to us today because the spiritual problem remains the same. The material solutions change as the time goes. The kind of houses we build are different, the kind of transportation is different, the kind of language we speak is different, the way we communicate is different. Just as far as the material aspect is concerned, it must undergo revision constantly. But as far as the spiritual aspect is concerned, that is, as far as my spiritual problem is concerned, that problem of seeking freedom, that has a universal solution which is provided by the scriptures. And Bhagavad Gita is one of those scriptures which gives us a universal message. Thank God it's not a sect. It is not even a religion or something. It's a universal message applicable to every human being at all the times. And it says this as the Upanishad says, as the Veda says, and every scripture says, Tattva Masi, that thou art. What is that? Oh human being, that freedom that you are seeking. And all I am seeking is real freedom, that's all. Although many of us have a tremendous fascination with a lot of powers, even what we call spiritual powers. There is a lot of fascination for that. I would love to be able to fly, let's say, or I would love to know what's going on in your mind. I would love to produce something from the air. So if this kind of... Uh, uh, powers are there, if miracles are there, we seem to be fascinated by them. But understand that, that miracles are also fine, they are beautiful things, but they are not the ultimate solutions. Ultimately what you and I are seeking is one simple thing and that is freedom, nothing else. And we do experience that freedom every day, thank God. Had our life merely been in, in, in nothing but conflict, we could not survive. God, the Creator, has provided this respite that every one of us is exposed to the experience of freedom every day, now and then. As I said, we can point to the experience of our sleep, what we call the deep sleep or profound sleep, which each one of us experiences every day. And what happens when I'm fast asleep? What happens when I am profoundly asleep? What happens to me? One thing we may note is that the experience of sleep is something that is loved by everybody. There is no exception. Everybody loves the experience of sleep. Is it not so? In fact, the sleep was created by God. See, everybody had a place. God created various things and everybody was given a place. The sleep also was created and the poor sleep had no place to go. So it went back to the creator and said, Sir, you created me, but where should I go? He says, go wherever these kind of lectures are going on, you know, you can go there. <laughs> so these are nice places really, nice air conditioned hall and comfortable seats, very, very nice condition, you know. What I am saying is that sleep is always preferred to anything else. That's the reason why we keep on shouting, you know, loud enough not to allow you to sleep. But even at night also, is it not that we look forward to that experience of sleep? How carefully we prepare that bed, make sure that the right kind of mattress is there and the right kind of comfort that is there and the right amount, you know, height of cushion is there. All preparations are meticulously made. 
that shows that I am looking forward to some pleasant experience. Not only that, but is it also not our experience that it is always, I am always unwilling to come out of that sleep also. That is why that alarm clock which rings at 5 o'clock in the morning is the most abused thing, poor thing. It gets the most number of slaps. Nobody likes it because I am reluctant to give up that experience of sleep. Is it not so? That itself shows that I am I'm experiencing a pleasure or happiness or something very desirable in sleep. That is why our scriptures also analyze in detail the experience of sleep. One beautiful thing about the scriptures is they analyze all the experiences. Our life usually is confined or our, our analysis or our consideration is usually confined to what we call the waking state. We consider that as our life. But we are told that no, waking is not the only experience that we have, even dreaming also is a valid experience. And the sleep also is a valid experience and that we can learn from them. Not that I recommend that everybody should keep on sleeping, that's not the point. Somebody even asked me, so you seem to talk a lot about sleep, is it what I should be doing? I said, no, please don't. At the same time, it is its own place, but we have to learn from our experiences. The deep sleep is a very important and useful experience. What happens to me at that time? In the deep sleep state, I become a total renunciate. Everybody becomes a total renunciate. Is it not so? Let us say that there is a beautiful, wonderful party, you know, I go to a party and there may be some kind of marriage reception, whatever it is. And when we go to these wedding receptions, then we always wear the best clothes, heaviest clothes. And women will wear all kinds of heavy ornaments when going to these kind of parties. One of our Swami said that these kind of parties are the mobile jewelry shops. <laughs> you can all kinds of you know, display you can see. We do that. As soon as I am in the party, what do I do once I come home? I want to go to sleep. It's already midnight. Then. Do I leave my shoes on and my suit and tie on and all my ornaments on and then go to sleep? Not at all. The first thing that I do is discard them, renounce them. That is called renunciation when I do not feel a sense of loss. After giving it up, I put uh, throughout my shoes, my socks, my jacket and all these heavy things are removed. All the ornaments are removed. I become light. Thus, I become a renunciation. That's, that's one first part of renunciation. As I said, after in a comfortable bed I lie down. And still I cannot fall asleep as long as there is some experience of pain in my body. The next thing I do is give up my awareness of the body. Give up my identification body. And still I cannot sleep. If there is some botheration in my mind, second thing I do is give up the identification with the mind. Even awareness of the mind. So renunciation is not, is not something unknown to us, we do that every day. Thus in the deep sleep state, I am free from all the conflicts. We were the other day traveling in the train, and in Indian trains, you know, quite crowded. And people all seated together on, on one berth which is meant for four people, six, eight, nine, ten people are sitting there, you know. And I could see there were some four people sitting there. And they were not happy with each other. Some of them were not on talking terms. Still they were sitting, they must be belonging to the same family perhaps, and not on talking terms. Each one would not talk to the other, would not look at the other one. And then the evening came, you know how Indian trains are, and then it's, it's like uh, the, the way the trains move, you feel that you are in like a rocking chair or something like that, you know. And so that's very, com very conducive for sleep. So slowly and slowly people started dozing off. And then it was a very interesting scene, you know. These fellows who did not look at each other while they were awake, once these sleeves started coming, then what do you find? So this fellow's head goes on this chap's shoulder. <laughs> this fellow's hand goes on this fellow's lap. This fellow's leg goes here. There was an entanglement, you know. That means in deep sleep state, they forgot all the differences. 
in fact in the sleep there is no awareness at all there is no there is no ego there at all there is no sense of individuality there is no sense of identification at all that i am so and so that kind of an identification or individuality is not there in the sleep state is not so right now you, you come to you, you know with your camera before me you will find i immediately as soon as i find that you going to take my picture <coughs> i just become all right you know because my picture must be okay when i go to sleep take my picture <laughs> i would not want to look at that picture where is my where are my clothes i mean how are they where is my leg where is my hand you know what is my hand nothing at all i am unconcerned in short in the state of deep sleep i am totally free from all the concerns all the worries all the burden that means that i have completely given up i completely renounce all the concerns and burdens and worries in the state of deep sleep and there what do i experience i experience total freedom from all this burden from all the concerns and thus i am happy so if you accept that in the deep sleep state i do feel happy then what is it that brings that happiness what is that enables me to experience that happiness freedom from all the concerns freedom from all the worries and anxieties freedom from that sense of individuality sense of ego i am so and so there i am not father i am not mother i am not boss i am not subordinate i am not rich i am not poor i am not man i am not woman i am nothing there is it not so thus i become free from all my complexes and that is the freedom in the deep sleep state we experience freedom understand that's all we need it is nice if you can fly in the air it's okay it's nice also if you can walk about the earth it's nice if you can produce some things and create miracles it's all nice but in in itself that is not enough in itself what i need is that freedom from anxieties worries conflicts divisions separation isolation sense of smallness so the scriptures are tell us hey it is bondage that you are experiencing the sense of smallness that you are experiencing is it really your nature that smallness littleness insignificance again i find myself an insignificant creature so many what does it matter what am i we i am in i am nobody here even a great somebody also will feel nobody because in in the whole universe of skin first time when the man went on moon i i used to be in, i was in united states those days we were watching on the tv you know they were rocket going to the moon and those astronauts taking pictures of the earth from the moon that time though this commentator was who was uh, describing this whole thing he said hey when you look at the earth from the space far away from moon the earth also looks like a little globe that's all it is we think earth is so huge and then we are so important people but then when you look at from a, from a distance what do you find earth is just one of those globes who am i i am a resident of the earth what is earth this is one of the small planets in the solar systems what is the solar system this is one of the systems in the galaxy what's a galaxy one of one of the billions and billions of galaxies thus if we look at ourselves with reference to the whole universe what am i in this whole universe there are billions of galaxies countless galaxies we have no idea what as to what is the the scope of the universe in that there is one galaxy which is you know the the milky way of that there is one solar system of that there is one planet of that there is one country of that there is one state or one town one hall one place what am i insignificant each one of us finds themselves an insignificant being and suffers from that so thus this insignificance also happens to be reality about myself at the same time the freedom that i experience in a state of deep sleep in other states also also seems to be a reality about myself what is reality about myself is insignificance smallness limitedness that i feel about myself is it the reality about myself the scriptures say no tatvamasi that thou art that freedom that limitlessness that fullness 
which is what you are aspiring all the time in fact that is what you already are what do you mean i am already free that how can i experience why do i feel bondage why do i feel a sense of smallness if i am already free or, or complete being how come I, all the time i seem to feel incompleteness they say that the sense of incompleteness is is not a reality about you so there are two things about myself completeness as well as incompleteness yes there are two things about myself completeness as well as incompleteness what are those two things let us come back to our, our, our earlier discussion that who am i am i the matter manifesting spirit or am i spirit clothed in matter the answer is i am spirit clothed in matter so about myself thus there are two aspects spirit and matter is it not so the consciousness which is spirit and matter these are the two aspects about myself and this is how the teaching of bhagavad gita begins as you must have heard number of lectures of bhagavad gita we know that the teaching of bhagavad gita begins with grief the one to whom the teaching is imparted his name was arjuna and the one who imparts the teaching the teacher is lord krishna quite well known so lord krishna is the teacher arjuna is the disciple what necessitated this not necessitated this teaching we know very well from the story of the mahabharata as you know very well bhagavad gita is a text which is in a in a huge canvas of mahabharata so lot of things have preceded this this teaching of bhagavad gita and we know also that lord krishna and arjuna both of them were friends lifelong friends in but in spite of that lord krishna never found it necessary to give this teaching to arjuna all these years but here in the middle of battlefield in a very critical condition in a condition of crisis or emergency crisis condition lord krishna found it necessary to impart this profound teaching something very rare teaching of this profundity imparted in the midst of battlefield something very rare they say that lord krishna has created a revolution this teaching which generally imparted in aranya aranya means forest means calm and quiet places because that kind of a serene atmosphere is what you need for this teaching lord krishna brought the teaching of aranya to rana from the forest to the battlefield another interesting thing while i'm on the subject you also know that lord krishna was a charioteer this is the scene of battlefield there is a chariot arjuna is a warrior sitting in the chariot Lord Krishna is the charioteer the driver we also know that the driver's seat is always lower than the seat of the master isn't it so driver is sitting at a lower seat now usually the tradition is that the teacher always sits in a position in a seat which is higher than the the listener is it not so like this because they say the knowledge is something that flows from higher level to the lower level like water that flows from higher level to the lower level if you want to receive water from somebody then your hand must be below that person then alone he can pour water then alone water can be received similarly also in order to receive knowledge we must be at a, in like in a position so symbolically there is nothing higher and lower really speaking but symbolically the disciple is seated at a lower level and the teacher is seated at a higher level this is a tradition even this also is reversed in the bhagavad gita where lord krishna the teacher is sitting at lower level and arjuna is seated at a higher level so aranya to rana from this even in, so lord krishna is a revolutionary he has revolutionized the whole thing in fact the bhagavad gita is an interpretation of the vedas and very beautiful interpretations are given as to how to make that teaching of the vedas relevant in our life and there was a whole definition of what is called yajna or sacrifice all of this is quite changed what is meant by worship 
What is meant by worship of God? What is all of this have been placed or presented or expressed in Bhagavad Gita in manner which becomes relevant to us in our day-to-day life? That's why Bhagavad Gita in day-to-day life. However, the occasion came here for imparting this teaching because Arjuna was very sad. He was, he was filled with grief. His heart was filled with grief. And it's not only that Arjuna's heart is filled with grief, as I said, heart of each one of us is filled with grief. No, Swamiji, I have no grief, I'm very happy. Somebody says, I ask him, hey, do you ever get angry? Say, so, angry I get. Do you feel jealous of someone? Yes, that I do. You sometimes find yourself uh, depressed? Yes, yeah, sometimes I do. All of these are expressions of grief. Anger is an expression of inner grief. Jealousy, an expression of inner grief. Greed, an expression of inner grief. Sadness, an expression of inner grief. We may not even know, but it is there. We have taken for granted. The reason of grief is I, out there, because I don't have a given thing. Therefore, I am sad. That's the reason why I go on acquiring things. You ask somebody, why you are sad? The other day, some people were there and Swamiji asked them, Hey, you, you don't look happy today. You seem to be sad. Why is it so? Oh, Swamiji, this was in a foreign, ab- abroad, you know, like uh, Indians are here. Somebody was asked, why are you sad? Oh, I haven't received a letter from my parents since last three months. I'm sad. As another person, hey, why are you sad? Swamiji, a letter came today, therefore I'm sad. <laughs> Ask somebody, hey, why do you look sad? Swamiji, I'm not married, that's why I'm sad. Hey, why are you sad? Because I'm married. <laughs> Some, hey, why are you sad? Because I don't have a child. Why are you sad? Because I have a child. <laughs> and then everybody gives different reasons of why they are sad. And one conclusion is certain, that the cause of my sadness is outside of myself. And therefore, I go around, I all the time, Go on reconstructing things around myself, rearranging things around myself, keep on changing things around myself, even bringing about change in my own body perhaps and my mind, because I have taken for granted that the cause of this sadness lies outside of me. So Arjuna was sad, his heart was filled with grief and Lord Krishna knew that grief or sadness is not a material problem, it is a spiritual problem. The sadness is not centered on matter, it is centered on spirit. Therefore, no material solution will, will cure this, will, will solve it. Otherwise, Lord Krishna could have told him how to fight the battle, what is the strategy, don't worry. He didn't say that. Because this is a human problem, problem of grief. I am grieving because I am small or limited. I want to become free from grief. Lord Krishna says, you are already free from grief. Tattva Masi. That freedom from grief that you are seeking, the freedom from limitation that you are seeking, you already are. If already I am, how come I am grieving? Because of a fundamental error that is committed in our life. As I said, I am a union of these two principles, spirit and matter. There is spirit also and matter also. So whenever I say, I use the pronoun I for myself, in that I, Both these things are lumped together, spirit and matter. This body is matter. My sense organs are matter. Even my mind also is matter. My intellect also is matter. Let us call this our personality. So this is my personality. My body, my sense organs, my mind, my emotions, my knowledge, all of this is my personality. But enlivening this personality, imparting consciousness to the personality, giving life to this personality is a spirit, let us call it person. Just using that name, person. Thus, I am a union of these two principles, personality and person. I am person and personality. Unfortunately, I do not know this. And therefore, this very personality is taken to be myself. 
see we can give the example of an actor this you must have heard an actor who is a very rich person a millionaire or a billionaire let us say that he is at the moment playing the role of a beggar so on the stage i see a beggar in that beggar two principles or two elements are involved one is a beggar other is a rich man there is beggar also at the same time there is a rich man also where is this beggar and where is the rich man the beggar is merely in the costume and the person in reality is a rich man a rich person wearing the costume of a beggar and appears to be a beggar what is the truth about that person the truth is that there is a beggar all right but the beggar is confined merely to the costume and even when he wears that costume of a beggar he doesn't become a beggar he may actually perform the acting as a beggar very effectively he can bring tears in his eyes very effectively a real beggar may not be able to do that but this fellow can do that because he has a background music and everything else you know in indian movies background music and songs and so very effectively he can beg you and what is appearance the rich is the truth about him it can happen that before coming to the stage he may have helped himself a little too much you know just sometimes to invigorate themselves they sometimes take a little invigorate or intoxicating thing he may have taken too much of it it is possible that when he comes on the stage he forgets who he is he may take himself a beggar then he may suffer from the pangs of beggary but in reality he is a wealthy person so beggar is a costume the rich man is the real one so beggar is a personality the rich is a person so what we see on the stage is a union of the person and personality the rich man and the beggar but we know if you know then there is no problem the other day i went to see a movie a play and there was a very young teenager nephew with me and i saw a beggar i told hey look at this beggar poor fellow come on let us give him one some money says swami ji is not a beggar he can employ 50 people like you <laughs> so he was a wise person with reference to the beggar because he could separate in his mind the beggar from the actor he could see that the real person is actor only putting on the costume of beggar does this requires what we call a separation in our own mind that is what is called discrimination discriminating or separating the two the rich from the beggar the actor from the costume the person from the personality and once that is done you are free once a beggar is able to discri- discriminate or separate that that costume from his own self he is free there is no further miracle needed at all this is a great miracle similarly also what is needed in our own life also is to realize that there is limitation yes i am a limited being i am an insignificant being no doubt about that but where is that limitation where is that insignificance that is in the personality who am i i am the person who is the who is presiding over the personality unfortunately i am not able to separate the person and the personality and i take the personality to be myself and suffer from all the limitations of personality just as if the actor happens to forget his identity he may suffer from the limitations of the beggar even though he is not thus bhagavad gita tells us the scriptures tell us that the grief that we are feeling the sadness that we are feeling really speaking there is no reason for that ashochan anvashochastam this is how lord krishna begins his teaching hey arjuna oh, oh you man you are grieving for reason for there is no reason for grief at all a wonderful message of hope and consolation what we find everywhere at all the times is grief no doubt about that we are told that there is no reason for you to grieve and that is the teaching that you are already free from grief tattvamasi that the word the free person that you want to see yourself to be the complete being that you want to see yourself to be is what you already are 
and the incompleteness is not your inherent nature it is something that belongs to the costume like the bulb is also union of the two things electricity and the filament electricity requires filament to manifest as light and every bulb is different therefore there may be a bulb that is very bright there may be a bulb that may not be very bright but electricity is the same is it not similarly also we are all personal their personalities are there I have a personality you have everybody the personality which is unique and individual and that is where all the differences are but the person manifesting from that personality is not different so there is something that separates you from me at the same time there is something that unites you with me also so the separation can be enjoyed provided that unity is understood otherwise that separation is the cause of all the conflict that you are not like me that you are different from me is what creates the conflict if that's only reality about ourselves there is no way that we can become free from conflict but thank god that is not the reality about ourselves yes there are differences no doubt there is a diversity but there is unity in diversity and this is a beautiful teaching that all the scriptures impart and bhagavad gita is is in essence imparts this teaching this is what our friend mani said that the word tatvam se and this is what bhagavad gita does i'm sorry i'm overshooting a time for a few minutes i'll take one more minute to conclude this there are three words in that statement tat tvam ase that thou art three words bhagavad gita has 18 chapters these 18 chapters can be broadly divided into three sections of six chapters each thus we have three sections first six chapters middle six chapters the last six chapters so this thus we have this tra- this three sections each one elaborating one word of this sentence that thou art this is a teaching and there are 18 chapters elaborating this teaching the first six chapters primarily address themselves to unfoldment of this one word thou who am i the second six chapters elaborate the second word that what is that that i am seeking call it god call it freedom call it what you will the second six chapters talk about that in the last six chapters i see that thou art the identity between this that and thou the identity between you and that limitless that is subject matter of the last six chapters we are in the next six days are going to discuss the ninth chapter of the bhagavad gita the ninth chapter falls in the second section which primarily talks about tat or that which we can call god and therefore ninth chapter is a beautiful chapter i mean every chapter is a beautiful but ninth chapter is very special it is in the middle of the bhagavad gita of the 18 chapters and contains some very beautiful verses and be very beautiful unfolds the nature of god not only nature of god that's not enough how to know him so tells us how to know him so talks about bhagwan god the bhakta the devotee and bhakti the devotion the the god the devotee and the devotion all these three things are beautifully brought out in the ninth chapter and so it's a privilege to be able to uh, share the thoughts of this chapter with you in the next 6 uh, days that we have and with that i'll conclude my talk this evening now i'll chant a, a, a shanti mantra then we'll disperse om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva avashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Gurubhyo Namaha Hari Om